So, I mean, I am a physician. I give this talk to doctors or other healthcare providers all the time. Um, I mean, I give different talks, but <laughs> like I've given a similar talk. So, you know, some of this is, is definitely some of the, the medical pieces. It might be not as relevant, but I think it's helpful for you to just have sort of that, maybe that bigger understanding of who might be sitting in front of you, whether it's to, yeah, register at the front desk or, um, um, or receive services. Um, so I'm going to go over, so I'll talk, this is sort of my objectives for today, which is to talk a little bit about, you know, what trauma-informed care is and why it matters. Have any of you had any training on trauma-informed care or like, or have you heard the, the three words kind of more recently? Yes, some, okay. Um, and then I'll talk specifically just about, you know, who is a refugee, who is an immigrant. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the refugee migration story to give you some insight into what experiences some of these patients may have had before they, they wind up in front of you. Um, and then we'll talk about the impact of trauma and torture on health and healthcare access. Um, and talk a little bit about chronic disease, health equity, the innumerable barriers to care, and then um, trauma-informed care. Um, so this is just a screenshot of, of our webpage for Utah Health and Human Rights. And I should also say that all of the services we provide at Utah Health and Human Rights are free to our clients and there is no time limit. So we're very unique in that way. Um, Asian Association of Utah, which is an awesome organization that provides a lot of really great services for refugees, but they have a five-year limit um, for how long they can provide those services. So we're the only mental health organization, case management organization that can do ongoing um, services for clients. So this slide is let's stop ignoring the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room in, I honestly, not just healthcare, but like in all of our lives is trauma, right? The like nasty person at the grocery store or that honks at you, you know, there's probably some trauma, a trauma response for that individual and you're just showing up in a place that's triggering them. And so in the healthcare setting, people are you know, enormously vulnerable. They're coming in with some kind of need. Um, and uh, the healthcare setting itself can be traumatizing because this is automatically the person is, has that layer of vulnerability. And my big sort of realization in, in caring for patients over time, you know, a lot of the time you might hear, and I don't know if med students are still trained this way or physical therapy students are trained this way about like, you know, the non-compliant patient or the, the patient who's nasty or, or angry. And, you know, we put all this blame on the patient then for not being able to improve their health or maybe follow through on their PT exercises or, or um, follow through on what's recommended. And most likely there's an underlying trauma response that's the barrier. And so in primary care, I screen every single new patient for, for a history of trauma because it informs how I'm going to care for that person. Um, and it also informs things I want to be thinking about from a prevention standpoint because there's a lot of data that um, shows us that, um, that a history of trauma increases the risk of chronic disease, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So trauma-informed care is based on the understanding that many of our patients have suffered traumatic experiences and the provider is responsible for being sensitive to this fact, regardless of whether the person is being treated specifically for the trauma. And I would expand this, I know the word provider is there, but that could, I love that like someone who is an MA or a front desk person is here because it's amazing how much all of the interactions that happen in the healthcare setting can impact a patient's experience and willingness to return or not. Um, so it's really recognize, and then um, it, so it's really recognizing that trauma is pervasive, and part of your job as working in the healthcare system is recognizing that, having respect for that. You're not necessarily going to dive deep and like psychoanalyze all your patients or be providing those services because that's not what you do but you still can have that recognition and treat that human being. I mean, we should all be treating each other with kindness, but you know, perhaps with that extra layer of kindness or compassion, even when you're having a really bad day. Um, so have you heard about what's called the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences? Just by a show of hands, I hear some head down. Okay, so this is like so fundamental to health, and what's amazing to me is this, um, it's actually from a study, I just can't remember when Felitti, 
Um, I mean, it was like in the 90s, I think, when this first came out, but it is taking a very long time to ripple into sort of mainstream healthcare. But Average Childhood Experiences Study was actually started at Kaiser in California, and they administered surveys to adult patients who were hanging out in the waiting room, you know, waiting for their turn to see the doctor, and they asked about different types of childhood trauma, five of which happened to them personally, and five of which were sort of like environmental, meaning that like a parent was incarcerated or a parent had depression um, versus the child being sexually abused, physically, you know, physically abused, verbally abused, something like that. Um, and it's pretty astounding because they basically found that individuals with high ACEs scores have an enormously increased risk of chronic disease, um, substance abuse, mental health symptoms across the lifespan, and on average live shorter lives than someone without a significant childhood trauma history. When I talk to my patients about this, I always say, okay, this would suck, or I would, you know, except that there's something we can do about it. And that's the important piece. And so what's kind of incredible is we now know there's neuroplasticity, right? The brain, we used to think that the brain was the way it was gonna be. At age 18, like life was over, you could no longer really learn as well or mature. And now we know that neuroplasticity exists across the lifespan. And it's this neuroplasticity building resiliency that actually improves and reduces that astounding risk of the impact of trauma on health. Um, so one thing that's really important in a healthcare setting is we're moving away from saying to someone like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you a non-compliant quote unquote patient? Why are you nasty during my session with you and I'm trying to help you, you know, um, to, to focus on like, what happened to you that was not your fault? Um, so, so we talk about ACEs as traumatic events, but then there's this other layer um, which is defined as a, this is the DSM-5 um, edition on the definition of a traumatic event, which is something that's experienced when a person is personally exposed to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence, or witnesses such events, or when they learn that such an event has happened to someone who is close to them, such as a family member or a close friend. And what we know is that most of the population, I'm not gonna take a survey of this room, but it's, it would probably be that some of you have experienced traumatic events in your life. And we know that there's a lifetime prevalence that ranges anywhere from 64% to 90%. I mean, 90% is a huge number, right? So again, that means that most people who are showing up next to you in whatever part of your life you're in have experienced trauma. Um, but we're gonna kind of take a deep dive and say like, okay, I'm moving from that level, which the reality is like trauma-informed care is important for any individual, and that may have even greater significance for individuals of refugee or immigrant backgrounds, because just by definition of being a refugee or an immigrant, they have likely experienced some pretty traumatic events before arriving here. So, the trauma-informed approach, and there's a ton online, or as I said, really, hopefully the university one day will invest in something called the sanctuary training, which is a trauma-informed training that starts at the institutional level. Because first of all, you have to be treated well in your job. You have to get along with your peers. There has to be respect. There has to be trauma-informed care within the institution before you can expect that people are going to be able to deliver trauma-informed care to their patients, right? And again, the reality is like, we'd be in a much more beautiful world if we approach things from a trauma-informed um, uh, mantle. So the first is to realize, to realize, and now you all realize that trauma exists in the population. The next is to recognize it in your individual patient or an individual interaction and then to respond, and respond has many different layers. If you're the front desk person and you know, oh gosh, here comes you know, Mr. Smith, I can't stand that guy, he always makes me really uncomfortable, he's so nasty, you know, all of this is, is going in as he's coming to check in, but your response is to, number one, recognize your own response, but then to greet him with kindness. And, um, and, to, and you know, when, when someone comes up, it's like, I've been waiting for you know, 20 minutes and no one has come up yet. Like, I am so sorry, you're right, that is really hard. And it must be that the physical therapist, the provider, whatever, is working with someone who's having a hard time today, you know, to try and, and empathize. Um, so, and that is all about resisting re-traumatization, right? It's not like, yeah, there's a long wait today, 
sorry, you know, like not to not to respond by being nasty, which of course I can only imagine like I personally run late with patients frequently because you can imagine since I'm totally into trauma and wanting to recognize it, I take a longer time with people. Um, and I know that my medical assistant and my front desk have to sort of manage that. Um, but it's really important, and we've spent a lot of time educating them, like how they manage that difficulty is really important. When I then walk into the room, when someone's been waiting for too long for me, I have to acknowledge, like, I am so sorry, and I just want you to know that if there's a time where you're gonna really need extra time for me, like, I'm gonna be there to provide it for you. But unfortunately, today I now only have 20 minutes because I just am already running an hour late. You know, to, to acknowledge that, but to, again, to resist re-traumatization. Um, and then I always talk about, like, Again, I am far from perfect. This is all a trauma-informed approach and what I aspire to, but it's really important to leave past stressors, past traumas at the door or with the last patient you encountered. So if you have a nasty patient encounter, like don't let that, we talk about trauma being a communicable disease, right? So you've had a, an unpleasant interaction and now the next person comes to you and you're sort of already pissed off and you may respond to them with maybe a little less empathy or an administrator said something to you or a colleague said something to you that was critical or you got bad news from home, like all those things, like that's really important that you recognize I'm feeling a need for you know a timeout or a couple of breaths before I then walk into this interaction with someone so that I don't take the trauma I just experienced and put it onto someone else. Um, some really simple ways of doing that, you know. So again, depending on what your role is, but you know, we obviously things like smoking breaks are permissible, right? <laughs> like I need a cigarette, like I'm going to go out and have a smoke. I don't smoke. I'm just saying, like, but the reality is, like, we should have breathing breaks, right? Like. Oh, or stress breaks, like I'm feeling stressed, I'm just gonna go out and take like a minute to take some deep breaths and recalibrate so I can come back and do the best job possible. So this is just a slide, I'm not gonna go through all of these right now, but these are basically the, the six um, pillars of trauma-informed care and we'll dive a little bit into each of them um, much later in my presentation. So now I'm gonna flip into um, the word and the definition of refugee. So a refugee is fundamentally different than an immigrant. A refugee is someone who has been, um, who's outside his or her country of origin, has really been forced to flee um, their homeland because people within that country, the government or a militia, um, is targeting them either specifically or a particular group um, so that individual has what's called a well-founded fear of persecution based on account of these five categories, race, religion, um, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. So that is fundamentally different than an immigrant who's someone who voluntarily chooses to leave their home country to further educational or economic pursuits. That being said, you could certainly have immigrants who would qualify as refugees, it's just that they enter the country in a different way. Um, so how many refugees are there in the world? Um, it's a pretty astounding number. There are 89.3 million people who have been forcibly displaced, meaning that, let's say, there was some horrible event that happened in Salt Lake City, and um, you had to leave your home, you had to leave your job, you had to leave your community for your safety and your family's safety you might move to St. George, right? You might move to another part of, of your state, or you might move to another state within the country. So um, that is included in that 89.3 million. Refugees are, are considered individuals who cross a um, border and then are seeking safety in another country. Um, just to give you an example, that 89.3 million number is astoundingly high just, and these are 2021 stats, um, in 2020, it was 70.8 million. So of course, the war in Ukraine is a big reason why that number has jumped so high. Um, of that 89.3 million, 27.1 million are refugees, meaning they have crossed a border to get to a place of safety. And the people that you're going to end up seeing in this clinic are like a teeny, teeny, tiny fraction. Less than 1% of refugees are resettled to another country. Um, and in 2021, 
there were only 57,500 refugees were settled throughout the world. We're not talking about like in the United States, that is throughout the world. Um, so it's a very, very small number. Obviously, the, what people want most is to return home. Most people don't want to come here, um, but they have to because they have no, you know, otherwise they might be stuck living in a refugee camp or they might be stuck living in an urban place where I have friends who are Iraqi refugees. They actually, one of them was in his, he's a physician, came to the United States, uh, was in a psychiatry, he's Iraqi, was in Jordan doing a psychiatry residency. His wife was an OBGYN working in Jordan, and she told me her salary was half what Jordanian OBGYNs were paid. So there's a lot of discrimination that happens for refugees, you know, even professional refugees that are outside their country. And then of course, I mean, neither one of them could actually practice medicine in this country. Um, without going through a, resident, a U.S. residency program and, and um, licensing. So many refugee populations are displaced for 15 to 20 years before resettlement. That is all political in terms of who gets to come here earlier than others. So like if you are uh, someone who is Iranian and you're of the Baha'i faith, which are a persecuted minority group in Iran, and you flee Iran, you go to Turkey, pretty much you'll be in the United States within one to two years. Because frankly, the United States government wants to say to Iran, screw you, we're taking your people in, your people don't want to live there. Versus a Somali refugee who flees Somalia because Somalia has not had a functioning government in like 25 years. Um, sorry, uh, since 1991, so a little less than 25 years. Um, the U.S. doesn't have any political interest in Somalia. But from a humanitarian perspective, yeah, we'll take some Somalis in from time to time. Um, and so many of the Somalis are hanging out languishing in refugee camps for you know 20 years and up. For 14 years, myself and one other physician, Paul Swoboda, did all of the refugee health screenings for the state of Utah. So we had over 11,000 refugees that we screened within the first 90 days of resettlement. And I would ask people like, you know, I'd take like a nutritional history because nutrition impacts health so much. And I would say like, I just remember a story. I had a Somali family who had been in a camp in Kenya. And I said, well, what have you, they'd been in the camp for 20 years. And I said, what have you been eating in that time? And the father looked at me and he started to cry. And he said, um, flour and milk. And sometimes we would be able to buy camel meat, but for 20 years. So can you imagine like the nutritional deficiencies, the deprivation, I mean, there's just so many layers like when you talk about trauma, right? Food insecurity. Um, so, so living at a refugee camp is, is no picnic. Um, and about half of the world's refugees live in camps. The other half live in cities where they can carry a car that it shows that they're a refugee that that's given to them by the United Nations High Commission on Refugees that gives them some degree of safety to be able to travel in the city. But they may not be able to go to school. Um, different countries have different laws on what refugees can access in that place. So um, for 2021, almost 70% of refugees were coming from just five countries. Um, that was Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan and Myanmar, which is also known as Burma. Um, obviously, we would now for 2022 add um, Ukraine to that list. And 38% um, of that 70% were hosted in five countries, Turkey, Colombia, Uganda, Pakistan, and Germany. And I always tell people, this is what gives me hope, right? That Germany, you can imagine Germany was a country during World War II that created a massive refugee um, uh, crisis and perpetrated horrific war crimes. And I'm actually the grandchild of, of um, many of my father's family were killed in the Holocaust. So to me, like Germany is a very painful country to think about. And now I feel this like immense hope knowing that especially under Angela Merkel, that country was one of the most hospitable, it's the only um, kind of what we could consider a first world country to, um, to bring in refugees and support refugees. So have you guys, do you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So what's amazing to me is like, I did not learn about this in medical school. It seems so fundamental to hell. I think, 
I think med students are taught this now, but um, but basically, you know, refugees exist like on the bottom two layers. Um, they are really struggling for the most part for um, physical needs and then also um, safety needs. And it's not until they come to a place of resettlement that they can begin to work on that third layer, love and belonging, and then maybe esteem. And I think only Einstein has reached self-actualization, so none of us will get to the top of this pyramid, but we can all aspire to. Um, so why do most refugees come here? I mean, of course, the very first one is safety. I mean, that's fundamental. Um, and then for freedom, and then you know, many times for their children. The majority of refugees that get resettled are women, single heads of households, so women and children. Um, so I put this up, this is the Refugee Act of 1980, and I put this up because resettling refugees, and I should say that the United States historically has actually always resettled the most vulnerable of the vulnerable of refugees, so to, to kind of think about that. So people with very significant health issues or, um, or trauma histories, or, and it could be both physical and mental health issues, um, versus like Canada that resettles refugees, but for the most part, they want refugees who are either fluent in French or English and are professionals. So we have historically always resettled the most vulnerable, and that was codified in the Refugee Act of 1980. It has always been very much a unifying bipartisan issue, you know, until the Trump administration. Um, so that's just why I put that up here, because this has been something that like sort of fundamental to who we are as a country. Um, we were really founded by immigrants. And, um, and so I think, you know, usually when I, if I give a talk to a larger audience, I'll ask people to like stand if they were born outside this country or stand if your parents were born outside this country. Usually by five generations, everyone in the room is standing, except of course, if they're Native American or if their family came over on the Mayflower. But it's just to point out, like there's such an anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment, and it's really just like, this is probably most of our histories. Um, so important to, to acknowledge that. So in this is um, a slide of refugee admissions. The colors correspond to different regions. And then it begins, the first um, box, I believe, is 1975 all the way to 2021, so those are numbers. So 1980 was the highest, 200,000 refugees were admitted. And you can just remember I said that like last year there were only 57,000, you know, 500 refugees admitted worldwide. So this was just 200,000 were admitted to the United States, right? That was mainly refugees coming from East Asia, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. And then, um, you know, the numbers have gone up and down. Um, Post 9-11, there was a dip. But obviously, nothing was as low as, as what we saw under the Trump administration. And so under the Trump administration, it was the lowest. So the, the total number of refugees that could be admitted to the United States is determined by the president. The president sets that number. Um, they also set the countries of, that they want refugees to resettle from, right? So everyone knows about the Muslim ban that Trump um, put into place. Um, and his determination was that, okay, the maximum that we're going to accept is 15,000, which again, had never been that low. Um, and typically, whatever the presidential determination is, we like rarely actually reach it. And so that was the reality with Trump. We only admitted around, you know, a little over 11,000 refugees in, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and what has also, what also happened is that there's a whole U.S. infrastructure to help refugees resettle. So for those of you who have worked with refugees before, you may have heard them say, like, my resettlement agency is not helping me with X, Y, or Z, or I don't have enough money for this, or, you know, and, and all of those things can be very true because resettlement agencies um, get pretty overwhelmed. Like, Utah used to historically resettle around 1,200 refugees, but it's not like it was evenly divided month to month. Sometimes there might be one month where there would be like 20 refugees that would get resettled, and then towards the end of the fiscal year, there would be like 200. And you have to have a staff who's able to manage both of those numbers. What happened under the Trump administration is that um, a lot of refugee resettlement offices had to close because no refugees were being resettled in their areas or a lot of staff were laid off. I mean, that happened here. We went from, you know, resettling like 1,200 refugees to resettling like 300 in a year. So you can't keep a staff. So 
the impact of what Trump, the anti-refugee sentiment, and all of the things that have happened are going to be very long-lasting in terms of its impact on, on, on successful resettlement. So just looking at some Utah numbers, um, our refugee population is probably around 50 to 60,000. And um, again, before Trump, we were settled around 1,000 and 1,300 refugees. Then you can see the numbers um, during Trump. Interestingly, though, this year we're not, I mean, we are resettling more, but it's, again, it's taking time because that whole infrastructure does not exist any longer, or it's been pretty damaged. Um, so as of the end of July, we had only resettled about 333 refugees, and um, a third were for the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then from Syria and Sudan. What is not counted are Afghanis and Ukrainians. So interestingly, both of those groups are coming into the United States, and it's a terrible name. They're called human parolees, right? It sounds like they committed a crime. So, but that's their designation. They're actually not designated as refugees. Um, they are receiving some of the benefits of refugees, meaning that they're eligible for Medicaid when they first come in, so they could potentially be accessing services in your clinic. Um, but they don't, many of them, like the Afghanis, are definitely getting some support from the resettlement agencies. The Ukrainians are actually coming in in a family sponsorship process, so they're not coming in through resettlement agencies. Um, so it's just, a, and that actually the state of Utah has no idea how many Ukrainians are here as a result. So it's a very kind of, um, a little bit loosey-goosey in terms of what's happening. Um, both of those populations will have to apply for asylum, and applying for asylum is a legal process that you can go through that where you have to prove that you meet that definition of a refugee, that you have a well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, nationality, membership, and a particular social group or political opinion. Um, and so there are slight, and they, they have to do that within two years of arrival into the United States. So they are, they are going to remain very <coughs> Um, interestingly, Utah was one of 15 refugee resettlement states back in 1980 when that refugee resettlement program started. We were one of just 15 states in the United States that was resettling refugees. So we have a long history, and Utah also historically has been a very welcoming state for refugees. In fact, um, our last governor was the only Republican governor to say that he would, would accept resettling Syrian refugees when all Republican governors in the United States said they did not want Syrian refugees in their state. So, um, so historically, our state has been very um, hospitable. So the refugee resettlement period, and again, this would just be for you to think about. You know, if you're seeing someone and they're from a certain country, you, and you know, you might say, well, how long have you been here? When did you come? This just breaks down the major populations that we were seeing in different periods of time. Um, recognizing that anyone who you know, has been here for five years or longer um, has had the opportunity to become a US citizen. So they may no longer um, identify as a refugee, and I know that you're using the word New Americans Physical Therapy Clinic, and that's some data that Redwood you know, did a really beautiful, I would say that's very trauma-informed, right? They went to the people and they said, what do you want to be called? For some people, the word refugee makes them feel ashamed. Um, so being known as a new American, I guess the problem with that is like, once they're here for a decade, why are they still known as a new American, right? I mean, they are US citizens, but this is in their, in their history. So today's refugees, something that is known as, uh, I just want to talk with you a little bit again about sort of trauma within refugee populations. So there's something known as a civilian casualty during war. And a civilian casualty means the number of civilians that were directly harmed, you know, as a strategy of warfare. So again, you probably read a little bit or hear on, you know, the radio about Ukraine and, and Russia um, targeting you know, places where they're like a, a train station, where they're going to be civilians. Um, and so I would ask you, what do you think the civilian casualty was for World War I? Like, what percentage of civilians were harmed during that conflict? Just, oh. What did you say? Very low. Very low, I agree. Okay, can you assign a number to very low? Because you're right, very low. Five. Percentage? Yeah. Under five. Okay, 5% actually, so 5%, great. So what do you think it was for World War II? 70%. Okay, not that high, but you're right, higher. So it's actually 50%, okay? And then what is it for today's conflict? Yeah? 
Uh, with drones, it's about 90%. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, 90%, right? I mean, that's, that is astounding. And so what it means is that inherent to the refugee experience is that in addition to whatever their own personal struggle was to reach a place of safety, it's now nearly universal, right? 90% of those individuals have likely also witnessed or experienced severe violence, mass atrocities, and government-sponsored torture and or terror. So within the field of refugee health, this is known as the triple trauma paradigm, which is that there's not one distinct event. So there's not one rape, one horrific witnessing of something, but rather multiple traumatic events that are divided into these different periods of time. So pre-flight, meaning the conditions in a person's home country before they fled. Flight, so getting from their home country to a place of relative safety, so crossing a border, which of course can be enormously difficult. Most people don't just like get on a flight and get to leave. Um, there can be very horrific stories of, of exile. And then, tragically, um, all of the trauma that, that occurs during resettlement. So this is just a long list of some of the things that occur, may have occurred to um, a refugee in pre-flight. And again, if you just pick up the newspaper and you read anything, which frankly I am not reading a lot about Ukraine right now because it's too traumatizing to me um, at the moment, but you know, this is a lot of what you're going to learn about. I still remember that early in the war, in the civil war in Syria, I read an article that in Damascus there was only one bakery left that was making bread. You know, I mean, in grocery stores didn't have bread, like no one was bringing bread into the country. So, you know, you just think about like Damascus is a massive city and that there was only one baker um, left. So things like food insecurity, um, of course, like a lack of access to health care, um, um, being, having family members disappear, having friends disappear, um, not being able to continue your studies, not being able to go to your job. And then um, I've highlighted the word torture there because that is sort of, of the individuals you might care for that are refugees, those who are torture survivors will be the ones who are most significantly impacted and frankly are probably the ones who are most likely to show up here because torture survivors have many um, physical health issues, a lot of chronic pain related to either injuries sustained during their torture or, or after. Um, so torture is defined as any act in which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on an individual for any reason, by or at the instigation of, or with the consent of a public official or other person acting in official capacity. So to just say like, it's something really bad where an individual is targeted by the government or what we call like the de facto government, meaning like Al-Shabaab or Al-Qaeda, if they have control over a particular area and they're harming a particular group of people, that is considered torture. So it is unlike domestic violence or interpersonal violence or child abuse, which we might use the word torture, right, because those things are awful as well, but it's not being perpetrated typically by the government um, or other political organization. So torture is an attempt to destroy a person's will to live and ability to trust in anyone or anything. And I highlight the word trust because that is so fundamental to providing care. And it's fundamental to providing, again, trauma-informed care to any individual. So at the core of ACEs, at the core of those adverse childhood experiences we talked about in the beginning, at the core of torture is that there has been a loss of trust between one human being and another human being. And reestablishing that trust is central to providing care. And I'll just share a brief story. I have a one of the, my roles at Utah Health and Human Rights is to meet with um, any of our asylum seekers, so people who don't yet have that refugee status. And I was meeting with a Venezuelan lawyer who is applying for asylum here, and um, he's in his like early 40s, um, and he has you know he came in with a you know very clearly in a lot of pain, walking with a cane, um, because he was tortured in Venezuela, and as part of his torture, his hip was fractured. He subsequently did get a hip replacement in Venezuela, but it never sort of took, like he still had chronic pain, 
clearly leg length discrepancy. So I was able to send him to an, an orthopedic doc who donates services to our clients. And that orthopedic doctor evaluated him, said like, you know, he's had a crappy hip replacement, he needs another replacement and referred him, um, I don't know if you guys know Aaron Hoffman, who has yeah, donates, the Hoffman Institute. Yeah, and donate, and I guess he has a nonprofit where he actually does um, pro bono hip replacement, because an asylum seeker is not eligible for anything like Medicaid. If they have a job, they might be able to purchase health insurance, but this individual does not have health insurance. So anyway, he saw Dr. Hoffman, he was set up to get um, a hip replacement, but he kept putting it off because he wanted to save up enough money for his recovery, and we're like, just do it, because you don't know how long that gift is going to be there for, right, <laughs> you know? So he ended up going in for his, like, pre-op labs, and anyway, it turns out he had a septic hip, so it became an emergency, a more of an emergency surgery. Um, he has since had his hip replacement, he's doing really well, and... Um, he said to his therapist at Utah Health and Human Rights, you know, this is the first time that I now believe that there is good in the world. Like, when I was tortured, I just started to believe that everyone was out to get me, that there was no kindness in the world. Like, how could, how could someone be so cruel to do what they did to me, you know, that only evil exists in the world? And he has talked about how he now has trust again in human beings, and it has made him want to live again. Uh, right and and like all of this story like it's just it is so profound what a good act or kindness can do for someone who has suffered so much so again even you know so I again I'm so happy that people from the front desk are here because it matters so much like how you are with that person you're so important to the health of that person just in a different way than the physical therapist or the doctor might be but your role in caring for that person is is just as valuable and in some ways if they've had a bad interaction with the doctor or the PT you being a kind front desk person helps mediate that some so just to, to think about that so it's just to say that 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 rebuilding of trust is fundamental to the care that you're going to be providing for individuals so I talk about the characteristics of torture because I think particularly in the healthcare setting it's important to think about of course none of us who are providers think of ourselves as torturers and yet so much that happens in the healthcare setting can feel like torture or be re-traumatizing to someone. So at least two people are involved, a perpetrator and a victim. Um, the torturer has total physical control over the victim, which we do, right? We say to the patient, like, go into this room, I'm gonna close the door, there are no windows, change into this gown, you know, like that's all very dehumanizing in a lot of ways. Um, and the reality is that much of what we do is painful. I mean, even having like a blood pressure checked, I don't know the last time you've had your blood pressure checked, if someone like cranks the cuff up to 220, you know, like it hurts for a moment. Um, and if we don't acknowledge that, like if we don't tell someone, you know what, I'm just gonna take your blood pressure, it's gonna hurt for a second, like it could feel like torture to someone again. <coughs> so torture is a public health epidemic it's practiced in over 150 countries. It has a very high prevalence in refugee populations. We know that like adverse childhood experiences, it also torture causes long-term health consequences for the survivor and their family, right? So the impact of trauma is often intergenerational. Um, we now know that that literally gets coded like in the DNA in addition to having um, potentially some difficult family interactions because earlier when we we're talking about like the impact of trauma like someone might be more angry or irritable or you know not show up as like the best human they can be with their family so screening for torture is really important um, because treatment does exist and um, this is basically the next two slides are just all different methods of torture which are horrific um, but I put this up here to just say the two types of torture that seem to be have the most long-lasting emotional effect on individuals are what are called mock executions, where someone might be hooded and then you know a gun is held to their head, triggers pulled and they're not killed. That causes very long-term psychological harm. And then sexual torture, which happens, of course, in both men, women, and children. So particularly in women, um, sexual torture is the most common type of torture perpetrated. And um, 
in the DRC, I mean, there's ongoing, I, I once read some horrific statistic that it was like, you know, one woman is raped every 48 seconds or something in, in, in Congo, and that is ongoing. Um, and then, of course, a history of, of, of sexual trauma in women increases their vulnerability here. So we have a lot of clients that were raped in their home countries, and then they become more vulnerable and get into unhealthy relationships in this country. So before I go to the next slide, um, so how common do you think torture is in refugee populations? Like if you were to give a percentage range, could you give a particular numbers? 78%. 70 to 80% you said? Okay. What others think? Does that sound? I was thinking like 50 to 70. Okay. So the reality is, and I should have said this, when I, when I gave that definition of the word, you know, refugee, the very first thing I should have said is that it feels strange to use one word to characterize such an unbelievably diverse group of human beings, right? Because different countries, different nationalities, different ethnicities, different language, different religion, on and on and on. And that's really what we see with, with um, the prevalence of torture. So there are a number of different studies that have been done, and I've done a couple of studies here. And the numbers are anywhere from 5% to 69%, and that's just what's documented. And you have to realize that to get a history of torture, you have, to, you have to ask the question, someone has to understand the question, and someone has to trust you enough to give you a yes. So probably that number of 70 to 80%, probably in some populations that is the case. Um, but what we found, and that 69% was among Oromo refugees, and Oromos are an Ethiopian minority um, population. It was very outspoken against the government, and so that was found in Oromo men living in Minnesota, refugees. So, um, but it is estimated that there are, that basically 44% of the refugees that live in the United States are torture survivors. To define that a little bit better, when I say the word torture survivors, they may be primary survivors, which means they themselves were tortured, or they witnessed the torture of another. Um, or they could be secondary survivors. And the secondary survivor would mean that they are the child of a primary survivor or the spouse or a close family member of a survivor. So this is just looking at some Utah data because this might be you know, someone that you see. Um, and this is looking at all of these different um, refugee populations. This is a total of looking at 884 refugees who were resettled in 2013. Um, and you can see that those from Iraq and Sudan, and that was Western Sudan, so Darfur, um, had the highest prevalence of torture. Overall, there was a prevalence of 34% among um, all populations, and the light gray is a primary survivor, and the purple is secondary. The red is both, but probably we don't have great data on that. And what we found in this study is that Primary survivors were much more likely than secondary survivors or refugees with no torture history to have a number of health concerns at the time of the refugee health screening. So this is just their very first visit to the doctor in the United States. They would just list, here are all my concerns. Um, and then they were also much more likely to already have a diagnosis of a chronic disease. And probably that, you know, 5.37 times more likely to have either diabetes or hypertension Probably the number is much, much higher, but you have to remember that a lot of refugees are coming from places where no diagnosis would have been made because there was no healthcare access. So that would you know, require that someone actually had seen a doctor before. So we know that torture has a profound impact on the physical and emotional health of a survivor, and it can cause chronic pain. So I think that's going to be what you're going to see the most of. Um, are you familiar with the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk? So I would encourage those of you who don't know that book to read it because it is just so helpful to really understand how trauma gets stored in the body, right? So again, when I said like, I was a family doctor and I thought that I was gonna like make everyone better in my office when I went to med school um, and then realized like, oh my God, there's so much here. So it just talks about, um, you know, how, how trauma really gets stored in the body, which is when you see patients with chronic pain, right, and of course there's that kind of chronic pain trauma um, cycle, which insomnia gets inserted in there as well, right? People have pain, it makes it difficult to sleep, which makes their mood worse, which increases their chronic pain, right? It just goes on and on in this horrible circle. Um, so, so just to know that like, 
physical therapy and especially like kind touch, right? Many times if someone was physically harmed as a result of their torture, um, they don't associate touch as something that's healing. And yet, again, when we talk about reestablishing trust, reestablishing trusting touch can be really, um, really helpful. So I'm aware of the time, I need to speed up here. <laughs> um, just to say that emotional health, so torture survivors are much more likely to have PTSD, depression, again, remembering that that might, may be treated, may not be treated, may impact how they're going to present um, in, in, with you um, and how likely they are to be able to follow through on, on their exercises that are being recommended. Um, and then, so torture survivors have a higher prevalence of PTSD and depression than refugees do, and then refugees have 10 times the prevalence of PTSD and depression compared to just the Western population. Um, so I think I've already stressed this point that refugees enter with many, many increased risks. I'm just gonna kind of flip through, okay. So we'll talk about um, health equality versus health equity. I love this slide. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So again, the fact that you're doing a New Americans clinic specific, fantastic, right? The needs are different um, than they might be with your other patients. And so um, figuring out what is going to work best. Like I love that the clinic is from 4 to 8 p.m. So hopefully like people who are working a job or taking care of their children would have the opportunity to be able to come in. So that's, that's awesome. And it's so important to be considering these things um, in order to really provide out of, you know, good care. So health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. And there are a lot of factors that go into that. Of course, the social determinants of health is fundamental. And there are so many structural barriers to health equity for refugee populations. So of course, language barriers, right? So I'm assuming, will you use interpreters in the clinic? From what you know, okay. So some of the challenges with interpreters, just some things to know. Um, and I don't, I don't have any research at all that I'm aware of on the role of the use of interpreters in like the setting of physical therapy. What I can tell you anecdotally as a physician is, an interpreter can 100% undermine the care that I'm giving um, because the I might recommend something, and the interpreter at the end of the visit in the car may say to the patient, that doctor doesn't know what they're talking about, that medicine can hurt you, you should get an MRI. I mean, like, I can't even tell you the number of things I've found out have been said, you know, by an interpreter to a client or to a patient that um, undermines that patient or provider-patient um, relationship. So something to, to be aware of, and then of course, making sure that whatever language your interpreter speaks is actually the language that your patient speaks. So I always start a visit by saying, what language do you speak? What language do you speak? Um, because a lot of the time, even something like Arabic, there are many different Arabic dialects. So like Sudanese Arabic is different than Iraqi Arabic. And sometimes a Sudanese Arabic patient cannot understand Iraqi Arabic. So you need to establish that. And then there are so many layers, like some of the refugee populations here are very small and there are a very limited number of interpreters. And so issues around confidentiality can be really huge, um, which is why sometimes using that you know, iPad on a stick or the phone interpreter actually may be better than an in-person interpreter um, because of the, the challenge with how small communities can be. Mm. Um, so discrimination, right? So that whole thing, I, I mean, I've, lived in Utah and practiced medicine, refugee medicine here for 22 years. And um, in the beginning, like, frankly, most of the healthcare, the healthcare providers were so checked out about providing cross-cultural care. And I remember having a patient with um, hepatitis B who I sent up to the U for treatment. And the note back from the nurse practitioner said, patient not eligible for treatment because they are non-English speaking and cannot understand. And I was like, whoa, like you can be, you know, sued for that. So um, things have come way, way in a way better place than we are now. But to just say that like discrimination does still happen, right? Like yelling at a patient who is non-English speaking, like they're not deaf, they just don't understand English, right? But like we see that time and time again. Or one of our clients at UHHR came, he was actually seeing one of the Orthodox and I think he had been late for an appointment, so he was told he couldn't be seen. And then he came early one time, and the doctor was running late, and he didn't, you know, like they're just, mm. like he didn't understand them why he had to wait, right? Like, so 
Um, so there's perceived discrimination, there's real discrimination, there's like, oh sorry, we can't get an interpreter that speaks your language, you'll have to go home, even though it took an hour and a half to get here. Like there are a lot of, of layers to this. And then, you know, in terms of how people dress, I mean, sometimes um, people don't have respect for the ways that, that, you know, so someone who's wearing a headscarf, they don't want to take that headscarf off if you're a male and they are female. That's not okay, unless you specifically ask them. So just lots of layers where discrimination can happen. Um, and so I'm just gonna share a story of a patient of mine because I just think it illustrates um, some of the, the fundamental barriers to caring for survivors and some of the really important things you have to think about from that trauma-informed lens. So this is a Sudanese woman who was resettled to Utah in 2003. Um, I first met her in 2013 when she was referred um, to Utah Health and Human Rights. And she, beginning in her 30s, had a pretty long torture history. Um, her husband had been politically active, speaking out against the government in Sudan, and as a result, she was actually imprisoned um, and brutally tortured a number of times. Um, she had had a very bad head injury at one point and was actually taken to the hospital because her torturers thought that she was dead. Um, she eventually decided that she needed to flee with her family. And so she fled to Egypt with um, her children. She, when she resettled to this country, um, she actually met up with her husband in Egypt. They were resettled as a family. Um, she had six children, and they were resettled as a family um, to Utah. But within a year, she got divorced from her husband. Um, and so she was left to raise her children. Um, she now has She's in her 60s. She has um, three sons and two daughters are very supportive. Many of them live here locally. She has 11 grandchildren. She actually is the primary guardian for her um, nine-year-old grandson who's on the autism spectrum. Both of his parents um, are currently in prison due to substance abuse. And the, her son, who is this child's father, was also beaten uh, in and, and tortured in Sudan. Um, while he was in college because of his father's activism. And so she said he's just never been the same. And he's the one who's, a, who's a, um, she's estranged from for the most part. Um, she's not involved at all in the Sudanese community. She's a devout Muslim. And I began caring for her in my clinic um, at Utah to Health and Human Rights in 2013. And um, in April of 2017, she was, in, she was in a taxi and the taxi got in a car accident. She hit her head like on the little thing where you pay. And so she was taken to the ER and she had a CT scan done. Fortunately, there was nothing acute, but they found um, a meningioma, right? It's a benign brain tumor. It was pretty small though. Um, and over the next three years, I saw her um, many times. I think it's actually 25 times. So on average, about eight times a year which um, you know, in PT you get lucky that you get to have repeated visits. In primary care that's not always as common, even though like, that is absolutely the best way to take care of patients who have like, a lot of complex health issues and really to take care of people um, in a trauma-informed approach because it allows you to build a relationship, rapport with someone. But she got diagnosed with a whole bunch of stuff, presented with a lot of, of symptoms that are very typical of individuals who have had traumatic experiences. I diagnosed her with a type of cancer. Um, she had a lot of bowel issues. Um, hypertension, prediabetes, and um, so yeah, so from April of 2017 to May of 2020, she had 25 visits with me, um, and I was doing annual monitoring of this intracranial meningioma because you want to make sure that these things don't like expand and become a problem. Um, and I had also referred to neurosurgery because I'm not an expert in intracranial meningiomas, but she had not gone. Um, and then I didn't see her in May 2020, right? That was definitely pandemic time. Um, and I would think about it from time to time, like, you know, like I used to see that person all the time and I don't see them, but I was busy. You tell the human rights, all of our services were, were like remote. Um, and yeah, and then that was that. And then in just this past August, I was at UHHR and our medical case manager came in and said, this patient is here and she's wondering if, if she can meet with you. I was like, oh my God, yes. Like I haven't seen her, what's going on? So I go in and I was like, how are you and why have I not seen you? And she said, I have to tell you what happened. I was like, okay. And she said, well, I went, I had a cough and I came to your office and someone, either it was someone at my front desk or the office manager 
basically said to her, like, you have to leave now, right? This was pandemic. We didn't have a, um, a room with special ventilation. We weren't set up to see anyone who had any respiratory symptoms, so we were requiring all those individuals to have, you know, go get COVID testing or go to an urgent care ER where they could care for them in a PAPA, right? Like, that's when we were, you know, the, the very scary time of COVID. So she said that the way she was treated in my office was so traumatizing, it reminded her of her torture experience and she never wanted to come back. So that's why I'm talking about that the front desk matters, right? So that, that experience destroyed her trust in me completely. The only reason she chose, but now she was coming back because she did trust me, because she had seen a PCP and had had another brain scan, and this is a meningioma, um, you can see that that is big. Um, it's actually in what's called Broca's area, so it, it, it could impact speech and language um, if, she, if it gets larger. And so basically she was told, um, she had seen a neurosurgeon and the neurosurgeon had said to her, you need to have this out like right away, like within the month. Um, otherwise, you know, you're gonna have a seizure, you're gonna have a stroke, it's gonna be bad. And she was pissed off in terms of how she was treated by the neurosurgeon. Um, and she just was like, I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? So from a trauma-informed perspective, like I'm not a neurosurgeon, I'm not a specialist in this, but what I know is that people have had trauma, ultimately it is a lack of control, right? I mean, none of us really have that much control over our lives, but it's a whole other story when you've really been physically contained, physically detained. So I talked to a radiation oncologist. I was like, is this something that she could have radiation for? They were lovely. They offered to meet with her. Um, they met with her. They then presented her case at tumor board with all the specialists to talk about what is the best treatment for this individual. And what came from that is like, yes, she needs to have surgery. So, you know, this was in August. Um, then I think by October, she was sort of willing to take that path because that's what was being recommended. So she wanted to go back to meet with the surgeon. She had an appointment, she showed up. He had some type of family emergency, didn't see her that day, even though she had taken all this time to get there, an interpreter, blah, blah, blah. So then we rescheduled that appointment and I actually went with her to the appointment um, because I wanted her to have this surgery. And I knew that her trusting me and reaching out to me that I you know, really carried that responsibility. Like, can I accompany all my patients to other doctor visits? Like, <laughs> no way. But I did with her, and we had her prepare a list of questions she had. She literally had 20 questions. I thought the surgeon was amazing that he answered every single one, but I will say that when the surgeon walked into the room, he did not introduce himself to me, nor to her son, nor to the interpreter. He did greet her. But I was like, wow, that is not trauma-informed, right? Really important, like anyone who's gonna have contact, I mean, we should be doing this with everyone, obviously, but anyone who's gonna have contact with a patient, hi, I'm blah, 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 and this is my role, right? Like, that's so important, especially in someone where they've had a history of having many people come in, do bad things to them, and not introduce themselves, or there's no pleasantries in torture, right? So long story short, she had her surgery, I think it's now about two weeks ago. Um, I went at 5.30 in the morning with her to, um, to go to the surgery and be with her and her son for two hours before she was taken back, um, and she is doing great. Um, she, unfortunately, the grade of the meningioma was significant enough. She now is going to have to have some radiation, radiation treatment, but you know, she didn't have a stroke, she didn't have a bleed. Um, she's going to do really well. So it's just to say, like, you could do everything right and someone could get in the way of that relationship. So just to be thinking about um, the extremes and then just to understand, like, you know, I guess, I mean, I'm guessing that if your patient no-shows, you're not like calling them and say like, hey, just checking in, you missed your physical therapy appointment. And yet with like a torture survivor or again, someone with significant trauma, calling makes such a difference. And I do that with select patients, you know, the ones that I know have a big trauma history, again, trauma informed. They might need an extra layer of care because so much of their life, people have not cared for them. And so there's an immediate belief that, that they're not worthy to be cared of. So if we go back to that trauma informed slide from the beginning, trauma informed care, the first is safety. So establishing, again, that's about establishing trust. Um, and again, a lot of this is talking about there's institutional safety. You have to feel safe in your work environment before you're gonna be able to help your patient feel safe. So that's a whole other layer I'm not addressing, but it's just to acknowledge, like this is not just what happens in the exam room or in the, in the PT room. Um, so 
thinking about how our environment, I already talked about how it can serve as a trigger for individuals who have had significant trauma, so to be very mindful of that. Um, I would just do a lot of, I do a lot of like, um, when I meet with someone, so as a, as a physical therapist, you could say like, I'm gonna ask you some questions. We're gonna meet together for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, I'm gonna show you some exercises. Like at the first visit, just orienting them to what is going to happen, that is trauma informed. Letting people know what's going to happen before it does. At any point, if you don't feel comfortable, if you need to use the bathroom, like you're free to do that, right? Giving them permission, remembering like, you want this to be a pleasant experience. Um, you know, I don't know if sometimes you have people change into, you know, shorts or something like that, but if there's an option, like giving them the option, just being really, really thoughtful about that. Um, you know, waiting rooms, prolonged wait times can be very triggering for people, so to just be aware of that. Um, again, this was like such a gorgeous room. I don't, I'm assuming, I'm hoping your physical therapy area is also really beautiful, like, um, because that makes a big difference for people. Feel, having windows is really important. Um, so trustworthiness and transparency, that's a lot, again, about building trust. Um, we already talked about, I think we talked about most of this. Um, I would say, like, asking them, you know, they might have been referred to you for back pain, but then they come in and they have elbow pain, and that's what they want you to focus on, and I don't know how much leeway you have to be able to do that, but it is really important to try and acknowledge that. Like, when my patients come in, I might have, you know, they might have a list of, like, 15 health concerns, and I'm most concerned about their diabetes, but actually they're most concerned about their ear pain, and, like, I have to make sure that I address the ear pain, and then I talk to them about the diabetes, otherwise, like, they may stop coming to me. Um, yeah. Sorry, can I have a question? Yes. So, I came from the ER up to here, and like a lot of these patients would come in, and that was their first form or their first, I guess, where they come in first for healthcare. But I can understand that's so triggering for them that, like, even right. when like, hey, you need to follow up here, they're not going to do it because of every. Did they have like advocates and stuff in place for like discharge with refugees in those settings? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say like it's absolutely needed and whether or not a healthcare system has that, like I think the U is doing a way better job than they used to and like Redwood Clinic has a refugee advocate, Anna Gallegos, who's incredible, but not all clinics have that. So I guess the easy answer is to say like, don't expect that there's gonna be follow-up and recognize, and in an earlier slide, that is one of the huge issues, like after ER visits, very unlikely to have follow-up, very unlikely to understand discharge instructions, um, very unlikely to follow through on recommendations that were made. So the reality is like no, unless they're connected, if they're connected to a resettlement agency, so that means like within the first maybe year after arrival, the, the period of time that a resettlement agency helps an individual refugee really varies, um, but, Maybe they'll have that assistance for about a year after, but it all depends on how good the person is at the resettlement agency, how many clients they have. So the number of people that slip through the cracks is vast. Okay. It is a deep chasm, right? And of course, those are then the same people that are just showing up time and time again in the ER, and because they're not getting trauma-informed care in their primary care setting, they're falling through the cracks there. And then the problem of, you know, and this is a, I, one of my, Margaret Solomon is a phenomenal, Med Peds doctor at Redwood, and she's newly the director of that clinic. And we were talking, I was like, how likely is it that your primary care refugee patient is going to get in with you when they have like an urgent need? And it's a pretty low likelihood, right? So a lot of individuals see multiple providers, and then people just get kind of passed through. It's so depressing to read, you know, office notes. A lot of the time, you just see someone like cycling through the system without really getting better. So, um, so yeah. I mean, that is aspirational for sure. <laughs> yeah. And the, I think, that, again, I think the university is doing, is, is starting to do more. Um, but there's a long, long, long way to go um, from that perspective. Um, also, just as an aside, you know, you may or may not be aware of this, but like I was giving a talk uh, to ER providers about refugee health, and one of the ER docs was like, well, I love when they come in because we can just take care of everything in the ER. And I was like, yeah, and do you know what happens if that person is uninsured, you know, their wages get docked. So the state of Utah, because the University of Utah receives state funding, 
can dock people's wages so that they are paying their medical bills. Um, that's a big problem if you've ordered like the big ER workup of you know ABC like airway breathing CT ER. scan. Yeah. What? Yeah. Just standard for the ER. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, there's a lot of layers there, yeah. right? And then someone's gonna be stuck with a bill, and they are never gonna go back to access care because they're spending like years trying to get those bills paid off. So that's a big thing we do. Our medical case managers spend a lot of time on the phone with healthcare systems, trying to get um, you know bills lowered. So peer support again. This is much more organizational. Like the work is hard. Acknowledge it. Like be able to to uh, have a five minute check in with with a friend. Um, I'm just gonna talk about um, humility and responsiveness. Right. So. So recognizing um, our own biases and stereotypes that we may have, um, and we all have them. We can be the best person possible. We still all have them in some way, shape, or form. If you've got, a, in this New Americans Clinic, I would really encourage you to find out what country your patient is from and go read a little bit about it. Read it about on Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, or some good websites, um, to just learn about like what they may have experienced. I would not, big capital letters, N-O-T, recommend asking someone a lot about their trauma history, right? Like, you could say, hey, you know, what made you decide to come here? Or you might just wanna say, like, how long was it from the time you left your home country to when you came here? But I would be really careful um, with asking kind of too many questions about anything in the past. I would focus more on, on present. And if they do share a history of significant torture or trauma, and they're not plugged into services, like, feel free. We take referrals from anywhere at Utah Health and Human Rights, so you can definitely refer um, patients to us. What we know is that refugees will not share a history of torture unless they're directly asked, and so this is sort of more geared towards people in primary care. And when refugees come in for their health screenings, they now are asked about a history of torture um, so that they can be referred to the proper place. But the other big thing is that people don't make the connection between mind and body, right? So they don't recognize that the traumatic events can impact their health, their stomach ache is because they've got serotonin receptors in their gut and they have depression or anxiety or PTSD and so of course your stomach's gonna be messed up and you've had long-term activation of the sympathetic nervous system, like it all makes sense. Again, that book, Body Keeps the Score, is a really helpful one for understanding that more um, and would be particularly helpful in the setting where you're helping someone with, with some type of chronic pain. Um, so the last thing I'll just leave you with, and, and this again is more for kind of the medical setting, but I actually think this could be something really helpful within physical therapy, and it's Arthur Kleinman is a, a medical anthropologist and psychiatrist, and he developed these eight questions, and they're supposed to be asked sequentially, um, but it's basically to say like, what do you call your problem? What name does it have? What do you think caused your problem? Why do you think it started when it did? What does your sickness do to you? How does it work? How severe is it? Will it have a short or long course? What do you fear most about your disorder? What are the chief problems that your sickness has caused for you? And what kind of treatment do you think you should receive? What are the most important results you hope to receive from treatment? So I think you could do some variation of that just to help people know like what what do they want out of out of physical therapy? What what do they hope to achieve? And I think you guys are always really good at that. I know when I've gone to PT, you know, like what are my goals? What how much have I improved? I mean that's awesome. Um, but I'll just share another story of a patient I have who it's actually a client at Utah Health and Human Rights, and she is I believe she's Congolese, lived in a Rwandan refugee camp for years. Um, she is pretty significant gastrointestinal issues. She's had the massive workup. There is nothing, quote unquote, nothing wrong with her gastrointestinal system, but she only can tolerate eating yogurt and bananas. Um, and so we asked her, we went through, I went through this with her, and basically she believes that a spell was cast on her in the refugee camp. And the only way that she's gonna get better is to see a traditional healer. I mean, that is really helpful information. And so, you know, we've worked to try and find a traditional healer. Unfortunately, there's not one in this state, you know, but we're, we're trying to help provide whatever support we can for this individual. So just helpful to, um, the last thing I'll just leave with is resettlement trauma, which, you know, tragically is, is significant as well. 
Um, so this is also another long list. I mean, I would just share that one thing that's really hard for our clients is um, the internet, um, is texting, um, because they may have family members that are still living in a country where there's ongoing war, and they are getting constant updates, or they hear that there was a bombing in a market in some region of Iraq and they know that they have cousins that live close by so they call the cousins and they can't reach them on the phone and then you know they are completely activated and re-traumatized and I think so much about this I mentioned that much of my father's family was killed in the Holocaust and my father is now 90 and he has very distinct memories of putting together like food packages and clothing packages to send to the Red Cross in Poland and Ukraine to family members that were there and like they felt like they were doing something. They had no idea that those packages never reached those people because they were all in concentration camps. But the act of doing had to make them feel a little better. And I just think about how for refugees today, they never get that sense of like, I have done something for my family member. Um, I have a lot of patients who send um, you know, money to their families like in Sudan. I have a patient who has a master's degree and he works three jobs, one of them is at Trader Joe's, you know, and he sends all this money home to his family, um, and he is just like, life is so hard here, it is so hard here. And he has five children, and I'm like, do you think you might want to stop having children? And he's like, I know I should, but it's so important to me, like culturally, like this is an important part of who I am as a, Sud as a, as a Sudanese man. So um, so anyway, just to, to share that there's so much that happens there. Um, so this is just a little bit more about Utah Health and Human Rights. Um, so there is no other place like this where I can talk about what has happened to me. When I can talk about it, it does not hurt so much. So I talked about um, that we really help work on Maslow's hierarchy of needs of helping walk, accompany people up this, this pyramid. We are strengths-based, so we really go from what, what the survivor needs. You know, If they need case management, that's where we meet them, not individual therapy necessarily. Um, and it's really based on the belief that every human being has a fundamental right to health. Um, and so we have a lot of different services for our clients. Um, and I will just share a brief story of a, a torture survivor from Iraq. Um, she was identified at the time of the health screening. She had lots of ER visits because she had you know, panic attacks frequently. Um, she had panic attacks in most of her therapy sessions for over a year and eventually her therapist convinced her to join a group because one thing about trauma, again, whether it's refugee trauma or individual trauma, adverse childhood experiences trauma, it's very isolating. And people really begin to believe and feel that they are the only one that has experienced whatever horrible thing. So getting people into groups is so important and I would just, as a like, little idea, say like, gosh, you know, it'd be amazing if eventually this New Americans Clinic, you did a group physical therapy for people with low back pain, you know, like that they're doing exercises together, that they can laugh a little bit at like how they couldn't do their exercise or whatever. It would just be a really nice model to, to move into. So um, in the first, this is something called a mind-body skills group. Uh, which is a mindfulness-based group that's run over nine weeks and it's um, two hours a week. And in the first group, we ask clients to draw yourself as you see yourself now. And this is what she drew. She said, I, I'm feeling shattered. And then um, the group teaches a variety of mind-body skills. It's not just mindfulness. And in the last session, we ask them to draw yourself as you see yourself now. And I should also add that she was, of course, still receiving all of the UHHR services. And she said, this is me. I'm standing happy with hope. And I really think that this was a group of all Iraqi women torture survivors. And just knowing they were not alone, they built community, it was really beautiful. Um, so the last thing I'll say is that you know you may hear some of someone's story, or they may share with you something really, really super sad and traumatizing to you. Um, and so you have to acknowledge that this New Americans Clinic, it, it might be hard sometimes. It might be really depressing sometimes. Um, so to just know that, prepare yourself for it, acknowledge that you still made the choice to do this or to be a part of this, um, and then, you know, 
do something with the emotion, whether that's journaling, talking with a friend, having your own you know, mindfulness practice or yoga or exercise. Activity is super important. Um, so acknowledging that you're having these feelings, um, engaging with someone else, and then action. Um, and then also just simply taking two steps, feeling your feet on the ground, taking a deep breath before you enter. This was actually in a study. They studied that this, um, this incredibly brief mindfulness moment um, actually reduced healthcare provider stress and improved um, care. So I'll just leave you with a couple other drawings. This was another client, draw yourself as you are now. It's her with tears. And then another thing we do in the first session, draw yourself with your biggest problem solved. And she just drew herself in, inside a casket. Mm -hmm. She was not actively suicidal. She just said, all of this will be behind me. Everything that was hard will be behind me. And then this was her last drawing in the last group. I am standing with others having hope. Mm -hmm. She's holding a plane ticket to go back to visit Iraq. That's what like the palm tree signifies. <laughs> So, um, and I'll just leave you with this one last quote. This was a Congolese client, actually a post-polio client. Um, and she said, I have many problems. When I was living in Africa, I would have to crawl to school on my knees because my legs do not move. I thought of killing myself. I had no hope. I thought that America would take care of all of my problems, but America is just as hard as Africa. But in this group, I have learned that we are not alone in our suffering. I compare my problems to the others, and it helped me see that my problems are not as big as I think. It helps me feel that I am a human like others. So that's it. These are some helpful websites that culturalorientation.net and ethnomed.org are particularly helpful for understanding um, uh, some of the like some of the considerations, you know, to say like how some of these populations may view the healthcare system, but of course know that everyone is still an individual of one. They may not, even though they're Somali and they lived in a camp for 20 years, they may not be the same as the other Somali who lived in a camp for 20 years. So still remembering that everyone's ultimately still an individual. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> any, any questions or was it helpful? Very helpful. A lot of the time when I give talks, my the title of my talk is like Global is Local. You know, we have mm -hmm. all these people yeah. who go do medical missions in oh, Ghana yeah, yeah, yeah. and Thailand and you know, that's amazing and the need is here too. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the and the amazing thing about the need being here is like you could actually really do it and there could yeah. be long term follow up and you would know it'd be mm -hmm. successful. Yep. So um, exactly. so yeah, it would be amazing. I just have to share it. that is dawn. Um, the first big storm up in Big Cottonwood Canyon. I've just never seen a sky that <laughs> color blue. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time in nature. I could not do this work if I lived in New York City or DC, <laughs> which is where I grew up and where mm -hmm. I went to college. So, um, so yeah. So anyway, but any other questions? But yeah, dream big. I mean, you're going to start to see things, and you're going to start to be like, oh yeah. I mean, we have a client. We have a really beautiful. I can sh actually send it to you, Piper. It's um, we have a knitting group. And it's been enormously therapeutic for our mm. clients. And so we, uh, we actually had a um, New York Times documentary filmmaker make a film about one of our clients who's mm. a torture survivor. And there's this incredible image where this client goes to like a gym and she's on the treadmill, like at an incline, wearing like wedge flip flops, you know? <laughs> Like, like mm. those are the shoes that she owns. That's what she goes mm -hmm. on the treadmill with. And you're like, oh my God, what if you fall? Or, you know? Mm -hmm. So then you're like, oh, we need to provide sneakers for all of our clients, you know, patients. You'll just start to see things like, yeah. So it's awesome to, to get inspired. Um, yeah, well, feel free to be in touch. I mean, Piper has my email. Always happy to answer any questions.